and we're going to do that. And okay, you guys can see this um, correctly, right? Okay. Well, I'm going to try something that uh, that I hopefully hopefully will work well. I'm going to split my screen and see if that. Okay, great. All right. So listen, I'm going to start, and uh, I apologize for all the all the little um, difficulties. Um, I'm going to try and make this as big as I can. This is about the best I can do at the moment. So um, unfortunately, I don't know if I can do this right. There we go. All right. So the way I have it set up right now, okay, I'm able to see myself and all your questions. Okay. And I'm going to go through a little presentation. This is from a lecture that I'm going to do in Osaka, Japan in a few days. Okay. So I'm going to be bouncing around a little bit. Okay, uh, my name is Dr. Jess Armine. Okay, I am from um, I am from I don't know where. Okay, I'm actually from Brooklyn. Okay, I've been in practice about 43 years. Okay, I uh, do a lot of different things. I basically do functional medicine. Uh, my background includes uh, being an EMT paramedic. I was I am and I was and am still a registered nurse. I'm also a doctor of chiropractic. I have degrees in forensic medicine, forensic examination. I've got a ton of functional medicine uh, certifications. I also teach uh, worldwide. Okay, I teach uh, functional medicine to other doctors. And I have uh, noticed one thing that is for sure, that the autism rates are rising. And what I'm doing in Japan in a little while is actually going there to teach them a new way of thinking about things. Uh, I, had, uh, I had a lot of responses to uh, the, um, uh, my, my post that said, well, what do you want me to talk about? Okay, so feel free to answer questions here. Feel free, I'm sorry, to ask questions here. Feel free to type in things, okay, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a couple of things, and, and I know you guys know this, okay? I know I have great respect for the parents of my autistic children or the parent, <laughs> okay? I work with a lot of autistic kids, and I'm going to tell you something. You guys are the best read, the most, you know, motivated people I've ever had the, um, had the pleasure of knowing, okay? So don't think that anything I'm going to say flies in the face of what you're doing. But I think we have to realize that the autism rates are rising. Um, this is just to acknowledge the fact that uh, other people who, I've, um, uh, who have contributed to this particular lecture, including my friend Sean Bean, okay, who I call the great and powerful, okay, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Lambert, uh, who's a naturopath in Australia, who is one of the most brilliant women on the planet, uh, Gillian, uh, Gillian Crowther, who is uh, Dr. Klinghart's chief researcher, and she gave me the uh, she gave me some input into the still danger response slides, and of course Dr. Ben Lynch, who um, I'm very sure you're all familiar with, uh, is a good friend of mine and has allowed me to use some of his um, pathway planners. Okay, uh, why I'm here, I don't I don't have an autistic child, but I have a child with schizophrenia. Okay, so uh, let me tell you a little secret: schizophrenia and autism. They parallel, okay? Uh, if somebody can say whether they can, oh, okay, what can help the cell membrane? So I am gonna, I'm gonna answer that like you wouldn't believe, okay? Because that's where the basis of all illness is. Okay, so I simply want you to understand that um, there is a, a lot of parallels here, okay? And I've been where you are. Okay, I spent the nights with my eyes slammed open and when I saw what the medicines did to my son, you know, I looked up at God and said, uh, this disease is messing with the wrong daddy, okay? And that's how I got here, okay? Uh, and again, this is a little bit out of, out, of, out of context. I tried to take a 300 slide lecture and kind of compress it, but I think we would agree that the, that the autism rates are climbing, okay? And uh, we kind of been doing that. When I say we, I mean, the medical profession, our point of view, and so forth. So, uh, again, please don't take offense at my words. Just kind of listen to the concepts. And, and frankly, we've been doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. And of course, that's the definition of insanity. I do joke around a lot. Please laugh. <laughs> I'll tell you a story later about that. Okay. So I think if we're going to be successful in re in 
resolving autism, we have to question our premises. We have to pop away from the status quo and search for what does work, okay? Um, I'm sure you've, you've seen this, that it's 1 in 59. Now it's actually projected to go to 1 in 25 births by 2025. This is not, this is not good. This is not good, all right? Um, in, in the, one of the reasons for this, I think, is that in the, in the ASD world, okay, in the 21st century, it's the waste basket, waste basket diagnosis. That's not an offense, okay? <clears throat> what it is is that any child who has any problem is dumped into the ASD <clears throat> diagnosis, which is really wrong because when you do that, you kind of stop thinking about it, okay? You kind of stop. When you make a diagnosis, First of all, most diagnoses are not diagnoses, but when you make a diagnosis, very often the investigation as to the reason for what you're seeing stops. I saw this many years ago with fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia, what they used to do was check everything. It was a diagnosis of exclusion, which means they checked the thyroid, they checked this, they checked that, blah, 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 blah. And then when they couldn't figure it out, they said fibromyalgia, okay, given that certain set of symptoms. When the American College of Rheumatology came out with their diagnostic criteria and all the points on the body, practically everybody, oh, as soon as they fulfilled that criteria, they gave them a diagnosis, gave them some lyric or whatever, and said, be on your way and be chronically ill. Okay. They stopped looking at it. Oh, hey, Australia, one of my favorite places to be. Um, good night, mate. That's right. It's tomorrow morning there, isn't it? <laughs> okay. So I want you to understand that I, and I'm going to do this in two phases. The word diagnosis means the root cause of a problem. For instance, a sore throat is not a diagnosis, it's a symptom. Strep throat is a diagnosis because now you know why you have it. Irritable bowel syndrome is not a diagnosis. Celiac disease is, okay, because now you know the root cause. Hyperacidity, not a diagnosis. Okay, H. pylori associated gastritis, diagnosis. Okay, so if the diagnosis does not identify a root cause, then it's not a diagnosis. Now, I realize how important it is with uh, autistic children to have a diagnosis because you're now, that now every, all the help that's out there is available to you. So I'm not talking about social services. I'm not talking about, you know, insurance companies. What I'm talking about is the actual, you know, what are we looking at, all right? Um, if you give a descriptive diagnosis, ADD, ODD, OCD, ODD, oppositional defiance disorder, schizophrenia, bipolar disease. These are all not diagnoses. All they say is the symptoms. They don't say what causes them. And when you give a descriptive diagnosis, like I said before, often this leads to suboptimal results because you don't investigate the root causes any longer. Why is that? Maybe because the common wisdom is autism has no root causes. Okay, so autism is a chronic illness with root causes that have resulted in the expression that fit within the criteria of what we call ASD, okay? Autism is a pathologic process. As such, there's a probability it can be re resolved, a very big probability, okay? And as you know, uh, autism requires a multidisciplinary approach to achieve resolution. What it's not, you're not born with autism. Autism is not the fault of the parents. Do you hear me? Do you hear what I'm saying? It's not the fault of the par parents. And it's not a roll of the cosmic dice. Okay? You don't go from 1 in 5,000 to 1 in 59 because of better diagnosis. It doesn't make sense. Okay? Chronic illnesses like autoimmune diseases, fibromyalgia, MS, Parkinson's, bipolar disorder, like I said, ADD, HD, OCD, depression, dementia, da, 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 da. they are, they have root causes. Okay? That results in the expression of whatever we're looking at. The chronic illnesses are pathological processes as such that can be resolved. And yes, autoimmune diseases can be resolved, in case you're wondering, okay? Because unless it happens from birth, and you can say it's genetic from birth, okay, why is it happening when you're 32? Why is it happening when you're 45 or 27, okay? <clears throat> Something has to set it off. Even if you say it's genetic, and you say it's genetic predisposition, something's got to set it off, okay? So autoimmune diseases... <clears throat> As soon as you start thinking that, you say, oh, well, there's nothing to be done, and that's wrong, okay? People are not born with chronic illnesses. Chronic illnesses are not the fault of the patient. 
and they are often blamed for it. Okay, chronic illnesses are not chance occurrences or shall we say rolls of the com co cosmic dice. And autoimmune diseases especially are not unrecoverable as they have precipitating factors that initiate the pathological processes. So as soon as you say something is incurable, you won't be able to cure it. I'll give you an example. If I'm with somebody and I say, you have schizophrenia, in their head, they're going to say, oh, shoot. I'm going to have to be on medicines for the rest of my life. This is this stinks. My, you know, I'm going to be on disability and so forth. If I said to the same person, you know, <clears throat> those uh, those auditory hallucinations you've been having, you know, and, and all the other symptoms. Well, really, they're a result of chronic leaky gut syndrome that's causing uh, an immense amount of inflammation in your body. That was caused by, and I'm actually speaking a case right now, uh, by Lyme disease, anaplasma, HHV6, and um, and candida. The only thing you're going to say to me there is, what do we do about it, Doc? I just told you you had the same things. One's incurable, the other one's not. So, point made. So if you wanted to, if I <laughs> if I could make this bigger so you could see, you could see the references that I made. Okay. Um, why the emphasis that I'm giving you on chronic illness? Why I keep saying that? Okay. Because all the illnesses that are treated are mainly treated according to an acute care model, not a chronic care model. There is a major difference in the way that medical physicians and most physicians are taught. Okay. And I'm going to get into it. All right, acute versus chronic. In the acute condition, the premise is if you eradicate the root cause, the body will heal itself. When you do that with a chronic condition, and this is going to where, where cell danger response comes in, you, what happens is the person doesn't get better. Okay, there's confusion as to why somebody will not heal, uh, blaming the patient. They blame the patient a lot, in case you wonder. Okay, they make, make them histrionic, symptom magnification, malignant. And the conclusion is that certain pathologies cannot be healed. Who knows about Lyme disease that the common wisdom these days is that Lyme disease cannot be cured. Horse hockey, okay? Absolutely it can be cured. You, you can't tell me you can't kill that bug. You can kill the bug. The problem is all the symptoms may not go away because what you'll see in the, in the cell danger response. There's a time when something becomes chronic that the cells will not heal themselves. And therein lies the path to healing for every chronic illness. But if you don't recognize that, if your thought pattern is, hey, I'm going to get rid of this, this bug and the, and the person will just plain old heal, if that's your paradigm, no one, when they get chronic, they're not going to get better. And then you're going to get confused. If you're a physician, you're going to get confused. And then the whole thing is, is that We've tested this, we've tested that, we've tested this, we've tested that, da, 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 and essentially saying, I can't figure it out, I, doctor, can't figure it out, so it must be your fault. I don't know where that came from. So in the chronic illness setting, <clears throat> the premise is there are root causes and downstream effects. Both have to be identified and treated. In chronic conditions, the homeostatic mechanisms, those things that heal the cells, won't reboot without intervention. And both foundational treatment and targeted root cause treatment are necessary. Okay, where does this all come from? Where is what is the basis of all illness? Well, it comes from you know this by different names, but all of you, I noticed, know what the cell danger response is, or I've heard the letters. Yes, somebody say somebody like answer. You know, <laughs> okay, say yes, we know. Okay, all right. So, Robert Navio, MD, PhD. Wrote a, um, uh, wrote a paper, and which one is this? This is actually a second one I have up, okay, uh, on the cell danger response in 2013. And uh, <laughs> Dr. Ben Lynch sent me the paper and said, just make it understandable. I said, okay. Three weeks later, I'm like cross-eyed. But essentially what he did, and this was, this was excellent, he, he worked on the paradigms that Dirk Pierce and Sandy Shaw with the reactive oxygen species. And what he did was identify all the factors that injure a cell. And then he identified all the factors that heal a cell. And then he identified when those factors stop working. Now, I'll go through that in a moment. I'll, I'll do it very simply. But in his second paper here, okay, and I, and I realized, uh, sorry about, you know, uh, you can actually look it up, but 
on the first page, this is an MD PhD saying the looking for the acute using the acute care model in uh, emerging conditions is what you should be doing. However, when dealing with chronic illnesses, treatments based on the rules of acute care medicine have proven to be less helpful and can even cause harm by producing unwanted side effects. And I, I put the emphasis in, okay? This is this is like, you know, I'm sure, he, I'm surprised the men in black weren't waiting outside his, um, at his house because that is the absolute truth, okay? So what tends to hold us, what tends to hold us back as practitioners and, and lay people who are doing their own advocacy, which you guys are the best at? Well, we kind of base our treatment or understanding, if you will, on, on parameters so based solely on scientific proof, okay, as demonstrated by placebo-controlled double-blind studies. We tend to ignore observational or anecdotal evidence that may lack enough scientific studies. We definitely ignore intuitive insight, or at least your doctors are, okay? And if I could, <laughs> let me see if I can make this big. Oh, I can make it bigger, hey, look at that. Um, Albert Einstein said, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind is a faithful servant. And we've created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. You know something? I teach a lot of doctors, okay? I mentor a lot of doctors. I teach, I go all around the world teaching. If, if you name a country, I've been there, not really, <laughs> not that much, but I, I do teach a lot of doctors. And one of the things I teach them is how to be a clinician, how to use their scientific knowledge, their clinical acumen, and their intuitive insight. And I tell them that if you can't find it in yourself to get that intuitive insight, especially when it concerns your child, listen to mom. Mother's intuition is never wrong, okay? Because this is the result, and you've seen it, okay? And I love this cartoon. It says, uh, good news, your lab results look great. Everything uh, is normal. You're the picture of health. We have to treat the patient, not the test. And I know there's a major question, and somebody got a little upset with me, and I wasn't being insulting. I was trying to get them to think about this, okay, that treating the test may be there's a difference. Being guided by a test is one thing. Treating via the test is wrong. If you've ever gone to a practitioner and you, you get an organic acid test, something like that, and they treat line by line, you're going to walk out with a shopping bag worth of product, okay? Something wrong with that, by the way, <laughs> all right? But the reality is we have to treat the patient, not the test. And that's not an easy task, by the way, all right? So if we want to defeat ASD, we have to start thinking differently. We have to start not depending on a single stream of data, meaning the scientific studies. We should consider data that up to this time was considered unusable because it was unproven, alternative, or if you will, woo-woo, or is simply unfamiliar to us, okay? Now, I'm gonna tell you something. This is hard to teach physicians, it really is. I am not looking for, <laughs> I am looking forward to speaking in Japan, but I have a audience of, mothers of autistic children and physicians, okay? All in one audience. I like to go crazy trying to write this thing, okay? Because I have to satisfy both audiences and we have to get off the scientific study bandwagon. I'm not saying that we have to, you know, start swinging dead chickens over somebody's heads or just using the crystals. What I'm saying is we have to use our intuitive insight, our acumen saying, hey, listen, this is working and it's not hurting anybody, so we should trial it. Okay, so what goes wrong that can cause the expression that we call autism? Well, the first thing we always talk about is genetics, right? And genetics has to be in its proper place. Okay, there's a there's a study out, um, the newborn screening for autism in search of candidate biomarkers. And I like the study and I dislike it for a couple of reasons. In this study, what they did was look at genetic polymorphisms and said, hmm, these things can lead to autism. But they did one step further. They said that these, and I'll show you the bigger picture here. They said that these polymorphisms can cause gastrointestinal dysfunctions or immune response or inflammation activation or decrease methionine in metabolism, which would lead to difficulty in the in, uh, SAM saw, which is your whole genetic uh, methylation process, and of course, down the transsulfuration pathway. Okay, what this did was say, guys, there are root causes 
for autism. In other words, you're just not born with it. Something set these guys off and created those effects, which then in turn created what we see as autism. Okay. So the proper use of epigenetics, by the way, I'm an epigenetic expert in case you haven't looked me up. Okay. Is to use them as pointers to increase your index of suspicion of what pathways may become dysfunctional under an oxidative stress load. Okay. The benefit of this kind of research is that it puts epigenetics in its proper place, a pointer saying, ha, huh, born like this, you have these things and this might happen. Okay. If it's already happened, I may know where you go, okay, where to go to treat it. Or if I know it beforehand, I may feed my child a certain way. I may look for certain things. I may be, shall we say, a little slower on the immunizations or not immunized at all. I'm not, believe me, I'm not going to get into that tonight. Okay. But you'll know how to intervene in the presence of pathology and you'll know the probabilities. But what, it, what I don't like about this particular study is that it uses the word diagnosis. It says diagnosis, short, if, if you can, well, thus diagnosis shortly before, shortly after birth would be, a, would be beneficial in the early initiation of treatment. The presumption you're getting here is that you're born with autism, okay? And although early intervention is necessary, what they're forgetting is that something causes autism. And, and when I say autism, I'm talking about the whole ASD. Since we're, since everybody's on the spectrum and we're dumping everybody in there, and since everybody has a root, has root causes, okay? Okay, uh, I don't know what that says. We, um, I don't speak French, I'm sorry. Russian, yes, French, no. Um, so even though this whole article refutes the fact that, you know, you, you shouldn't go just by this, uh, it uses the common terminology and it kind of feeds into the, the um, process of thinking that, oh, you know, you're born with autism. You're not. Okay. You're simply not. All right. So if you diagnose somebody early like this, or you diagnose them genetically, just like that, based solely on the genetic polymorphisms, what's going to happen is kids are going to start getting labeled. Okay. The parents are going to have the feeling like that nothing can be done. So here you are, you get a genetic test. Oh, you have all the predisposition for autism. And all of a sudden, this is what happens. Oh, no. Okay. Um, the parents, you remember, we got big pharma out there. Just think, it, it, I, I know, I know. Oh, God, I'm going to get shot. All right. Let me ask you a question before I go into the big pharma. I'm not going to go into the big pharma bandwagon. We live in a chronic illness society. So I ask you, is there more money in... Curing diabetes or treating diabetes? Is there more money in curing cancer or treating cancer? Is there more money in curing autism or letting all this stuff go on? And people are making a ton of money. Okay. Now, middle ground is going to be important, but realize that since this is the input everybody's getting, parents can be dissuaded from making healthy choices for their child that would prevent autism, okay? And really, when you when you say, okay, we can get diagnosis right at birth, okay, what, end, uh, what happens is you don't look or you don't, you're not cognizant of things that can in fact result in. So if I looked at a certain set of genetic, a certain genetic profile, I'd say, huh, well, listen, I'm not gonna twist your arm, but it's probably a really bad idea to immunize this child at, you know, a neonate. By the way, I, I treat a lot of autistic kids. In, I treated a lot of autistic kids in Poland, and what I found out. Uh, well, thank you so much. Um, I try to make things simple and doable. Okay, it's what I'm known for. And besides, you shouldn't be impressed that I can pronounce polysyllabic words, or I know every biochemical pathway in the body. And I know how all this stuff works. Okay, you should expect that from your provider. Okay. My job is to make sure you understand it so that you can be, you are the participant. Okay, this is a partnership. When I work with people, I don't dictate. I'm a partner. Okay, so, um, ooh, lost my thought. Okay, <laughs> okay. That's what happens when you compliment me. I just lose it. <laughs> so if you think about it, if we knew 
that a certain thing was going to happen. And, and oh, by the way, I was talking about Poland. I, I, I was wondering why uh, when I was seeing these kids, there was like something that was niggling in the back of my brain. Because I always, when I take a history, I always take a history from in utero forward. And I was getting the impression that the kids were coming out correctly, but then when they went for their first feeding, to being given their first feeding by their moms, they're either like this, like, or they're very flaccid, okay? I went and re-interviewed people, which is not easy in Poland, by the way, because I don't speak Polish, okay? But I found out that it's a common thing in Poland to give two immunizations at four hours after birth. That is foolish. Why? Okay. By the way, the immune system doesn't organize itself for two weeks. Do you ever? And even if you don't believe me, you don't want. You want the scientific studies? Go have fun. Okay. Why is colostrum colostrum? All right. Colostrum is mother's milk, first few weeks, right? It has all the immunoglobulins that the baby needs to protect itself. I wonder how that happened. Okay. I wonder why it's like that. Okay, you know, up until recently in history, babies drank mother's milk. And if they didn't have that, they had wet nurses, other women who breastfed. Okay, and as long as they kept, you know, they kept lactating. I, I don't know how, I'm not asking. All right, but at the first part of, you know, in the neonatal period, mom is producing a ton of, it's a lot of fat in there because the, the brain needs the fat and a lot of immunoglobulins. You got to say to yourself, okay, I wonder why that's true. And why am I throwing immunizations to somebody with that have things like formaldehyde, uh, mercury, and so forth and so on? A little bit of that in a baby brain can't be good. If you want to know what's in the immunizations, go to Wikipedia, type in immunization ingredients. It will give you a long list. You'll see the commonalities. All right. So we now know that autism has root causes and the genetics will give you some predictive power. Okay either after things happen or before things happen. Okay, methylation, by the way, everybody's methylation crazy, all right? Uh, it is not the end all and the know all, okay? Uh, this is the folate pathway. Uh, when you look at it, in case anybody's interested, I'm gonna do this really fast. If you're looking at a pathway, it is not the polymorphisms, okay? It's not the reds or the yellows that are the big problems. The big problems are, and it's I, I'm gonna make this bigger so you can see that part that I'm talking about. Hey, I can do it. All right. When you look at a pathway, and this is the folate pathway, this, this is where you get your folates and they get rendered to dihydrofolate, tetrahydrofolate, and then the big fancy names till you get to 510 methylene tetrahydrofolate. When I say something fast, ignore it. Okay. So when 510 methylene tetrahydrofolate is created, MTHFR, the dreaded MTHFR, methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase, reduces it from this to 5-methylfolate, which is the active form, and gets actually a chance to participate in DNA uh, replication and so forth. But everybody's looked at the MTHFR like, ah, you know, you've got 50, count them, 50, 5 zero variants. We look at two. I can explain to you why. All right. But when you look at the pathway, these little curly lines you're seeing, those are the cofactors. You want an enzyme to work, you need the cofactors, NADPH, NAD, ATP, NADPH, you see a lot of NADs here, that's B3, okay? You don't have enough NAD, you don't have enough B3, this pathway is not gonna work. Uh, Dr. Ben Lynch here put in purple those things that slow down the enzymatic reaction. In this particular case, folic acid, we all know that my good friend, Dr. Ben, hates folic acid. He's got a t-shirt that says folic acid and I can't repeat it in, uh, in mixed company, okay? Green tea, grapefruit seed extract, methotrexate, which is used for rheumatoid arthritis sulfur drugs, and dairy antibodies, all right? Those things will slow down the enzymatic reaction. So if you don't have enough cofactors to run a pathway and or you have factors that will slow it down, you're going to have problems, okay? And the polymorphisms, the SNPs, mean very little because you are born with them and they only get activated or show up as a problem under an oxidative stress load, which would involve some of the things you're looking at. So once you get to MTHFR, you need B2 and B3 to run it. And if you have too much SAMe, too much cell danger response, too many reactive oxygen species, too much sulfur, too much folic acid, it'll slow it down. Interestingly, if you have too much DHF, dihydrofolate, the reason for that is because it's being produced up here. If you're producing too much of it, this is a feedback mechanism. 
Okay, that's how your body balances itself. I, I, okay, I mean, so that's how you look at the pathway. And by the way, methylation is only part. This is methylation. That's the rest of the biochemical pathways of the body. Okay, so you can't just consider methylation. You have to consider all the biochemical pathways, okay? Um, because the reality is you can understand everything right down to the quantum level, which can only intervene globally. Guess what? I understand lots of stuff right down to the core level, okay? But I can't give a, a, ch a child something and say, go here. You know, it's not going to happen. The body will do what it needs to do. So if we support the body's needs, get rid of the root causes, repair the damage, all we have to do is get out of the way, and the body will heal itself. That's kind of the way we work. Okay? Um, I don't know. I don't know. By the way, just for anybody who wants to know, I'm sorry, this is this is a little chopped up. You can't treat a polymorphism. As much as you've heard from people, you cannot treat a SNP. You can't, okay? When somebody says, I treat MTHFR, they're telling me that I could take a homozygous MTHFR and make it normal. And they're lying because it's impossible. When you're treating methylation, you're supporting the methylation process, okay? That's absolutely correct and you can't treat a complex multifactorial condition with a protocol based approach which is another thing that you know i see a lot of you have a protocol for this you have a protocol for that you have a protocol for this and i say what is the problem with that thinking well, you're not thinking root cause you're thinking i see this let me treat that with a protocol i see this let me treat that with a protocol it's not your fault it's the way the medical people have been trained and therefore are training or advising you, okay? You know, ever since the 1970s, uh, where doctors went from being GPs to being all specialists, okay, they were given these books called Little Brown Spirals. They were little things that fit in your lab coat. And they're very cool because you get a lot of knowledge then. You, you flip through these books and it was a big algorithm. It would help you figure things out. And then, of course, when PDAs came out, they, you know, did that. They turned the root. After a while, the diagnoses that were allowed in these algorithms were the only things available and the treatments were the only things available and they instead of becoming suggestions they became standards of care that's why everybody's got such a narrow focus these days okay and the problem with any kind of chronic illness but especially kids on the spectrum is that you're identifying things you have to identify certain diagnoses before you can treat there's a little bit of wonkiness there Okay, a little bit of weirdness. Okay, uh, anybody who's read Sherlock Holmes, okay, one of Sherlock Holmes' favorite sayings is, it's a capital mistake to theorize without data. Okay, the phrase actually is this. It's a capital mistake to theorize without data because insensibly you will twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. So we have a set of diagnoses, which aren't diagnoses, but diagnoses that I have to fit somebody in because otherwise I can't treat them along the algorithms that I know. What we should be doing is twisting our knowledge to that person's individual physiology. And guess what? That's why protocols work for some people, don't work for others, okay? There's too much individuality, especially with kids on the spectrum. Okay, and Dr. Ben Lynch, we all know, has created Dirty Genes. If you read Dirty Genes, by the way, um, the reason he went like this, it's seven genes, seven, okay? And what he does is it helps you identify them and then he puts you through a soak and scrub, which is basically foundational treatment, okay? In other words, clean up the environment. And then his spot cleaning is basically working with the effects of any partic that particular genre of SNP, which I think was de-emphasizing this great amount of, of uh, genetics that you know we're, we're trying to still comprehend, okay? So what he was creating was a more holistic approach. Okay, um, let me go. All right. Uh, by the way, just, just so you know, uh, when you're looking at genetics, okay, and you see a heterozygous or homozygous, this means that innately, okay, the gene, the gene that creates an enzyme, the enzyme will be working at about 60% efficiency, okay, and the red means at about 20% efficiency. Okay, what about CVS? What about it? Okay, 
CBS is part of the trans transsulfuration pathway. If you try and treat CBS, we've done that before, by the way. I'm not telling you because of theory. theory we've done that. Okay, it doesn't work out. Okay, because it's only part of the transsulfuration pathway, which in fact creates glutathione. So there's two parts of the transsulfuration pathway you have to be concerned about: the creation of glutathione, and then when glutathione is created, when it's used up because it's your master antioxidant, it becomes oxidized. And we have a recycling mechanism that takes oxidized glutathione called GSSG and creates the active glutathione again. So if that recycling pathway is not working, which in a lot of people it's not, and you build up the oxidized glutathione, guess what it does? It blocks mitochondrial function. It actually blocks the entry of what's called the electron donors into the electron transport chain. In other words, it blocks the mitochondria and decreases the amount of ATP pr produced. That's why you get sick. I, Sean Bean, and Dr. Ben Lynch found that relationship about eight years ago. Okay, and since then, we've been able to correct mitochondrial dysfunction a whole lot easier because the reason that some other protocols weren't working was because they weren't considering the transsulfuration pathway. So the only thing that has to be decided is, is there a problem creating glutathione or a problem recycling it, okay? The reason is that you might have problems creating glutathione, lack of substrate, okay, lack of cofactors, or if the cofactors, and of course, if you have a lack of cofactors, you're going to have a backup of sulfur and you're going to get a lot of ammonia. But believe it or not, what blocks that part of the transsulfuration pathway most are mycotoxins, okay, biotoxins, molds, okay, that'll slow it down to a crawl. All right. Then the recycling pathway, okay, is where I see most of the polymorphisms. Just giving you a factor, this is a biopterin pathway, okay? It happens to be my biopterin pathway. Don't get scared, okay? So when you see the creation of dopamine, let's say, okay, you'll see in me that I'm going to have trouble breaking down dopamine because my COMT and MAO are pretty well polymorphic. What isn't shown here is also I'm red or homozygous in, in dopamine beta hydroxylase. So when something starts upregulating my system, okay, my dopamine goes way up. Okay, that goes way up, and I have trouble breaking it down. When you have high dopamine, you start going from excitation to anger to paranoia to hallucinations to autism. Okay. It's not a false issue. Uh, um, whoever said that, uh, explain yourself if you want me to answer the question. Okay, so if you're looking, this is not what you're seeing here on the screen is not an exactitude. Now, now take my son who's got the schizophrenia. Obviously, he has similar genetics to I. Why is his dopamine through the roof and mine not? Okay, this is the real question. It's what's creating the high dopamine, and do we have enough cofactors and coenzymes to run the pathway, okay? When you're creating um, serotonin, all right, it's important to create serotonin, but if you have, on the, with the oranges here, that's what upregulates an enzyme. If you have inflammation, lipopolysaccharides which are bacteria or stress, this enzyme is going to get upregulated. It's going to steal the tryptophan, and it's going to create quinolinic acid, which is a hell of an excitotoxin. Okay, so here you have somebody who's being influenced by microbial illness who has a pathway that looks like this. If I see this pathway and I listen to the symptoms, okay, I'm going to know what might be causing this. So if I have a low serotonin and real high catecholamines like dopamine, I'm going to start looking here, which gives me an indicator that I'm really looking at a microbial illness. Okay, that's how you use genetics. Okay. And Dr. Ben was one of the first people, aside from me, okay, that said treat the body, not the snip. All right. So, really, we're going to start talking about a, a new way of thinking, which is we call bioindividualized medicine. It never really took, you know, root, but I'm reintroducing it, which basically thinks about all of the things that can injure a body epigenetics, um, mitochondrial function, the neuroendoimmune uh, system, and cell membrane integrity. Okay, 
we talked a little bit about the epigenetic data and how to use it, okay? Um, just to, real super fast, okay, what the SNPs mean, like I said, is about, is about enzyme function. So I usually equate a highway to it. So if it's normal, it's an eight-lane highway. It's heterozygous. It's a four-lane highway. And homozygous, it's a two-lane highway. If you happen to be in the UK, normal is an M road. Heterozygous is a B road. And homozygous is a C road. And let me tell you something. I've been on your C roads. Ugh. All right? It makes no never mind if there's no traffic. But as soon as you have traffic, things back up. And the traffic is bacteria, heavy metals, viruses, parasites, so forth and so on. Okay? And don't think that if you have a bunch of green uh, genes that everything's good. You can have enough oxidative stress to block up even a good pathway, okay? And if I, like I told you before, if I see something like this, I'm going to start thinking excitation. When I see something here, this is a transsulfuration pathway again, okay? And I know you're interested in it, so I'll move it over if I can. You have two parts, CBS down to glutathione, and this is where the mycotoxins can block, and then the recycling pathway, which is NAD dependent, by the way. So when I, I've re, I read a lot of these things, like, like hundreds of them, okay? And I have to tell you, if I looked, if I had to pick out one pathway that had the most polymorphisms, it's this one, okay? This is a very common thing, especially with people with chronic illness, because that's what I do for a living. My practice is made up thoroughly of people who've been here, there, and everywhere and haven't been getting better. So this is the way that I, I think about things, okay? And this is that recycling I talked about. Um, the blockage, okay? And by visualized medicine, I want to get to... Um, you don't unblock mycotoxins. I'll tell you in a sec, okay? All right. I want to let you know this is this is where we've been wanting to come. I want to I want you guys to remember the importance of the cell. Okay, the biggest problem is we we tend to think of things like methylations over here, glucuronidations over there, you know, um, detoxes over here. Everything happens within the confines of the cell. Everything. Okay, found the cell is the foundation of all life. All right. So what a cell does is create energy, manage energy, and manages waste. Okay. And if you've ever wondered if there's a common ground to illness, okay, because what I did a while ago is I made up a chart of all symptoms and the different illnesses, and basically all had the same symptoms, okay? Was in the cell danger response, which I'll explain now, okay? Uh, as I told you before, Dr. Navio in 2013 wrote this particular pa paper, which is the metabolic features of cell danger response, and he wrote it in the uh, um, uh, for mitochondria. Okay, and I'm a great believer. Listen, I, cell danger response is mondo complex, big time. Okay, but if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. All right, I could really regale you with all the complex stuff, but you know what I'm about to show you is, trust me, is more than is <laughs> you're going to understand it better than most doctors. Okay, um, I'll go back to that in a second. Um, um, the cell danger response is how is the metabolic response of the cell to protect itself itself and thereby you from harm and the basis of reestablishing homeostasis, okay, is a mis mismatch between functional capacity and available resources. In other words, if it overcomes your ability to compensate, you're going to get sick, all right? This is what activates the cell danger response, okay? Things, I mean, very, things that you already know. Do you like the uh, sad cell phase? I, I made this. Fine. <laughs> okay. Heavy metals, um, benzene, heat, salt, shock, trauma, chemical and physical. Microbial, absolutely, especially parasites people. And all the psychological, emotional, and spiritual things that can happen to somebody injures the cell just as much as putting mercury into the body, just as much as having a parasitic illness. So although this may not be uh, germane to a child on the spectrum, adults who've been through uh, difficult relationships, who grew up in non-nurturing childhoods, who've had abuse of many different sorts, okay, are going to be injured physically just as much as if they had chemical or microbial illness, okay? So when people start fobbing it off or that you get fobbed off 
as being psychological, you can take this paper and shove it right up their nose. So when the cell danger response occurs, this is what happens. There's temporary stoppage of those things that heal the cells. Okay, and that's things like electron, uh, cellular electron flow from the mitochondria, oxygen consumption, vitamin availability, cellular fluidity, which is the cell wall, okay, and metal homeostasis. Uh, also, things like redox reactions, creation of proteins, and so forth and so on. Why does this happen? Because what the cell is doing is shutting down, creating its own reactive oxygen species to kill the bug. That's what it's doing. And when the bugs are dead, the body will stop, reverse the cell danger response, and promote healing. Here's the problem. When it becomes chronic, sorry, you can't see this either. When it becomes chronic at some amorphous point, okay, you have the, the ability to reboot gets interfered with and you stay in the cell danger response. Okay, and healing becomes impossible unless you track down the root cause and treat the effects. So I'm going to go back for a half second here. A lot of you have been treating children for heavy metal toxicity with chelation. Andy Cutler's big on it. All right. The reason those metals are there, if you look at them for the most part, unless you've had an exposure, the reason those metals are in the cells are because of chronic cell danger response and we cannot get rid of them. You're breathing them through the air. That's where you're getting the metal buildup. To chelate a child can be problematic because you're pulling out trace minerals also. One of the better ways of dealing with it, unless like I said, you had an exposure that has to be dealt with, okay, is to reverse the cell danger response and allow the cell to engage in metal homeostasis like it's supposed to. Okay, and there's certain patterns on uh, heavy metal testing that you can see that it's more cell danger response than a than a particular um, a particular exposure. Okay, this creates the root of all evil, which is not money, by the way. The <laughs> by the way, um, uh, the root of all evil, the, the love of money is the root of all evil, but the root of all evil is inflammation. Okay, inflammation affects. If you can find this thing from Live Love and uh, Fruit. Uh, dot com. It explains the effect of inflammation on every single part of the body. Chronic inflammation will affect you body-wide, okay? And even time talked about chronic inflammatory response syndrome, which is inflammation. It's usually associated with biotoxin illness, okay? But, but there's loads of things that will set it off, and it will affect the entire body. So in the papal cell danger response paper, there's this particular figure that shows all the degenerative diseases, all the neurodegenerative things that are caused by one single thing, which is the chronic cell danger response. Okay. And believe me when I tell you that that is the basis of all illness. So chronic inflammation is where you get mental illness, is where you get autism, is where you get autoimmune disease and all chronic illnesses. Okay. And uh, this was in the source in my book that I wrote with uh, Elizabeth Lambert. Uh, called Leaky Gut, Leaky Cells, Leaky Brain. It's available on Amazon for Kindle if you want to buy it for a whole $9. It was just translated into Japanese, if you're interested. But I very simply explain... Well, oh, here it is. <laughs> oh, upside down. I very simply explain... We simply explained a very complex subject and gave you loads of ways of dealing with it, okay? But chronic inflammation has cause of rise in all kinds of health issues, especially neurological issues, okay? The major problem is cell membrane integrity because it has been overlooked for generations. We look at the cell wall as a wall. It's it's a membrane wall. We're not going to get into the argument of the, of, the, um, um, of, the, of the terminology. But look, the first of all, the wall is made out of uh, a phospholipid bilayer with cholesterol in it. The carbohydrate portions are how your immune system recognizes you. They have uh, protein channels, receptors, all kinds of stuff happen at the cell wall. The cell membrane is what protects you from things getting in, transmits messages, gets rid, gives you all your nutrition. Okay, everything happens at the cell membrane. When this becomes dysfunctional, okay, the cell membrane uh, protection goes away. Uh, you don't get the messages, 
the integral proteins and so forth don't, which are acting as pumps or channels, stop working, okay? It contains your receptors. You, you wonder what somebody who has dysautonomia, POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, or any of those really nasty autoimmune diseases and so forth. This is why. Because the cell membrane integrity has been compromised and your immune system does not recognize non-self. Okay? And remember that the cell is the master of, is the functional unit of the body because you put cells together, you get tissues. Tissues together, you put, you get organs. You put organs together, you get a body. Okay? And leaky cell membranes, okay, will interrupt all your physiological processes. And don't get stuck on the word leaky. Okay, people yell at me, eh, no, leaky. No, no. But it's a concept. It's, I, it would be harder if I called it cell membrane disintegrity or dysfunction. Okay, that's a lot harder. That's a lot harder to concept. Leaky is a good concept because it's true. It, it is leaking. It's not working. Okay, so we can't recognize self from non-self. That's self and that's non-self. Okay, your immune system uses those little carbohydrate thingies, okay, on the cell wall, cell membrane, okay, to recognize you and to recognize pathogens. Okay, so when I look at a, a, a disease I, and I'm thinking about autoimmunity, I'm thinking about the immune system, I'm thinking about envir environmental factors, hormonal factors, genetic predisposition, and so forth. There's no such thing as autoimmunity, okay? Yes, I know I'm going to get shot on my way out, okay? But I live here, so ha, my office is in my house, ha, and so they're going to have to come get me. But the reality is, if we looked at it from the point of view as that the cells have been injured, fix the cells, fix the root causes, a lot of things are going to change, okay? And I have loads of examples of people with autoimmune disease that don't have it anymore, by scientific evidence, in other words, their lab work, okay? By the way, it was interesting. It's a little complex, but it was interesting that the cell danger response is responsible, believe it or not, for gluten sensitivity, okay? And it, the increase in oxidizing conditions associated with the CDR and cell lining of the intestine leads to changes in the uptake intracellular processing and folding of the proline and uh, glutamine-rich process, gliadin-33 peptide and an increase in gluten sensitivity. So guess what? That's what's been going on, okay? And if you want to know also about using, utilizing um, enzymes properly, your pH has got to be correct, okay? And the biggest problem with everybody is that they're not producing ATP because you're more acidic, okay? So when you go through glycolysis, your glucose creates ATP, uh, ATP is your energy, Okay, so when you when you uh, go through glycolysis, uh, you have lactic and pyruvic acid, and that has to be put into the Krebs cycle, which is this honking amount of biochemical processes before it produces what goes into the mitochondria. You have to be alkaline for that to happen. You need oxygen, OHs, more than Hs. Okay, so if you're on the acidic side, your enzymes aren't going to work, and your ATP is not going to be produced. Okay. And there's a question here that I'm going to address right this second. Hold on. Get to where it was. Okay. Uh, it says you can look at the video on CBS. Dr. Lynch said more information. Even Dr. Yasko doesn't talk about all CBS. Most people don't check the markers. And she has up for regulated CBS. Um, follow um, low sulfur diet for long. Thank you for writing that. Guess what? I was around and working with these guys when we were teaching, when we were treating CBS, okay? And that's exactly what happened. People got low sulfur and got into worse problems. I was the guy screaming, treat the person, not the SNP, treat the person, not the SNP. And the first day that Dr. Ben mentioned that in his, um, um, mentioned that in one of his uh, podcasts, I called him up and I said, I wonder where you heard that before. And he was like, hamana, hamana, hamana. I said, I, I was good because he has a bigger voice than I do. And even Dr. Yasko is not looking at CBS anymore. You know why? It's not a good predictor of anything. Okay. You use the genes. You use the genes as pointers. You cannot tell by looking at the gene whether it's going to upregulate, downregulate, or whatever. You look at the genes for pointers in the pathways. So when you have CBS, CTH, you go, all those guys, you look at them together, you say, hmm, there might be a problem in that pathway. Let me look to see if there's clinical correlation of it. Okay. Um, the histamine, I'm gonna stop on that. Histamine pathway. Okay. Um, uh, so 
when you want to, and, and I'm going to answer all your questions in about 10 seconds. If you want to fix everything, you fix the cell danger response, which means you got to repair the cells, repair the gut, and seal the blood-brain barrier. Okay. When you have leaky cells, leaky gut, you have leaky mitochondria. You have leaky blood-brain barrier. Okay. And hence our book. Okay. Um, this is getting a little bit too complex. Okay. How do you fix a leaky gut? Well, here's the thing. Thank you. Um, it's it's simple. The concepts are simple. Okay. And unfortunately, I don't know why this is drives me crazy. I see a lot of people. Okay. And I have thousands of patients and, uh, and I, I'm a single practitioner. So, you know, I, I interview everybody. Like I actually take a history. It's kind of, it's kind of strange. Nobody does. Okay. But I have found that when people are fixing leaky gut, they're doing it all wrong. I don't know why. Okay. I'll ask somebody, how are you working with your leaky gut? Oh, I changed my diet. Thank you. That's not going to fix it. How are you fixing it? Oh, I'm taking probiotics. Okay. Here's the principles in fixing a leaky gut. Number one, you want to recreate the layers. There's a mucus layer. There's a cellular layer. Okay. You want to break down the foods real well because our greatest source of antigens is poorly broken down food. Think about this. Proteins have to be broken down to their constituent amino acids and they get absorbed and get reformed in pro by the body into other proteins. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what happens if you don't break down the protein completely? You get these short chain polypeptide bonds, which are antigens, and they get absorbed and you have an antigen antibody reaction. So one of the quickest ways to help your body decrease this antigenic load is to digest your foods better. And of course, there are things I know what the trick to finish up is. I explained it before. Okay. Um, my apologies. Okay. If you break down your foods, okay, you won't create as much in, as many antigens, and you won't get the you won't get the antigen antibody reactions. Okay. Now the second thing, if you create a mucus layer, that was made to trap the antigens and any of the xenobiotics and so forth. If you have an organic acid test, or if you have and you look at um, some of the parameters on those tests, you can tell, oh, this person, if the secretory IgA is next to nothing, if it's really low, okay, you probably don't have a mucus layer, okay? And your immune system in your gut is giving up the ghost. It's like, forget it, I'm not going to work with you, okay? So the secretory IgA is that antibody that wraps up and holds on to antigen so it goes out, you know, in the mucus layer out the other end, all right? The cells, okay? are held together by tight junctions. And everybody's worried about the tight junctions, which they should be. But you can't just pull a cell apart and get the tight junctions. The cell is injured and dies. And that's what loosens the tight junction. And when that happens, it releases cytokines, which pull in white blood cells. Sort of like ET, you know, when the little girl wanted him to go in the house, put the Reese's pieces down and he followed him. Okay, that's how white blood cells know where to go. They tear the whole place apart. They release a bunch of elastase. It chews up the mucus layer and get this big hole. Now, the body normally just puts it together, okay? But happens a lot, and you're going to have a nice channel for antigens to go through. As soon as it goes into the basement membrane, otherwise known as the lamina propria, okay, a macrophage starts chewing on it. It becomes an antigen-presenting cell, which is very much like a maitre d' that brings it over to a naive T cell, and that cell decides whether under cytokine control whether it becomes an, a natural killer cell, Th1 pathway, or an antibody, Th2 pathway. Okay? And the more antibodies you create, the more memory cells you create. Therefore, as the antigens go through, guess what happens? You get more and more of an antigen-antibody reaction, and that's chronic inflammation. So guess what? To fix it, you want to digest your foods better, right? You want to put a mucus layer in. Now, if you wanted to do it individually, you could use demulcent herbs, things like slippery elm, like chia seed, uh, inulin, zolmesivum, that when you eat them, they, they become mucus, okay? And you want to fix the cells themselves. The cells themselves require things like zinc carnosine, yes. They also need phospholipids, okay, or lipids, absorbable lipids, in order for the cells to heal. And once that, and then of course you want to recreate the microbiome, all right? When that stuff starts happening, the body starts healing very quickly because the inflammation starts dropping. Once you start fixing the gut on, a, on an aggressive basis, the inflammation will drop because the major reason for all inflammation ongoing is the leaky gut syndrome. So you start dropping the inflammation that way, your body's got more energy, if you will, 
to start fighting what you need to fight. By the way, you want to get rid of pathogens? Normalize the physiology, okay? Make the environment inhospitable for them, and they will go away. Yes, you have to treat them, but you stop them from replicating. You stop their, their forward motion. Okay, guess what? You can really do more by normalizing an environment than by doing it piecemeal, okay? So you know, we use something called gut butter, okay? It's a, it's a something you make yourself, okay? It's in, um, it's in the book, okay? Explains it really, really well. It's not difficult to make and it's not expensive, okay? And I got to tell you something. I've been using gut butter for a while now, like eight months, and I have patients who've been bedridden who I've had a lot of trouble with are getting better, getting up, walking, talking, stuff like that. You know why? Because this works better than any of the other products out there to repair a gut because it's a lipid-based thing you're using. Um, hmm, hold on. I'll read it to you. Ah. All right. In gut butter, they have, they have olive oil, um, either salted but organic butter or coconut oil, natural honey, probiotics, um, delactate free probiotics and carnosine, something called Cialex, which is sialic acid. Uh, butyrate, um, if you're in the United States, it's easy to get this sun butyrate, which is the liquid butyrate. Um, a lot of people put glutamine powder in. I've taken it out because a lot of people, especially my patients, get uh, negative reactions because they're not converting the, uh, uh, the glutamine to... Glutamine goes to glutamate, and then it's not converting to GABA. Okay, it's um, it's all sitting in here if you wanted to get the formula itself. It is not a product that you can buy. It's something you make, okay? Um, oh, and there's a couple of ingredients, okay? And what, all you do basically is put the stuff in a blender, blend it up, put it in a jar, put it in the fridge, okay? And guess what? One tablespoon a day, okay? Um, there's a bunch of variations of the formula, okay? Um, we're getting kind of late here, so I don't really want to start getting into neurotransmitters and how to balance them and what they are and so forth. I'd love to do a lecture on that, okay? One of my nicknames is the neurotransmitter whisperer, so <laughs> I would um, I would adore doing that. So I would really like to answer any more questions, so let me see um, who's asked what, okay, because we're, we're getting on an hour here. and um, Okay, what can help the cells uh, membrane besides... PCPS, PEA, and so forth. Okay, the way you fix cell membranes is you want an absorbable form of phosphatidylcholine. Now, if somebody has really a really bad gut function, really bad gut function, okay, it's probably better to use liposomal PC, which is available from a couple of different places. Okay, and the reason for that is that in the hierarchy of absorption, IV is the best. Liposomal is the next best. Sublingual and transdermal is the next best. Okay. Then there's liquids, then there's powders, then there's capsules, then there's tablets. So if you can get liposomal, you it's going to get into the cells. Okay. Uh, I know Quicksilver Scientific has a liposomal PC. Uh, there is a multivitamin, multimineral in a liposomal uh, PC from Victory Nutrition International called Protovite, which is a, something that I use an awful lot because it's everything. Another way of doing it is transdermal, okay? Uh, there are transdermal patches out there that are multivitamin, multimineral, and they have omega-3 patches that have omega-3s, omega-6s, and phospholipids. Believe it or not, it gets absorbed through the skin. And I use those a lot with my autistic kids. They love me for it because you're putting a little patch on them that's about one inch square. Okay, they don't feel it. And they're getting their vitamins, they're getting their minerals, and you can even fix that entire uh, recycling pathway because they have a CoQ10 patch. No, I don't have stock in the company. I wish I did. <laughs> okay. That has CoQ10, PQQ, D-ribose, and everything you need for the recycling pathway and for the mitochondrial pathway in this one little patch. Okay. Who knew? But I know it works. Uh, if you're, it, these are just options of how you get something into somebody. It has to get through the gut in order to work. So you have to think, is it getting through the gut? Is it getting from the serum into the cells? When somebody's really bad, I like to assure that it's getting into the cells 
So for a couple of months, I may use solely liposomal products. Okay, it depends on whether a child tolerates it or not. My next, my next go-to would be the patches because at least I know it gets into the bloodstream and it's bypassing the gut, okay, while I'm fixing the gut. Okay, I said we don't. Okay. Can I use PEA for COMT, GA, MAO, GG? Uh, okay, please, if somebody, if that person could repeat their question, can you use phenylethylamine for COMT, GA? I don't know what the GA means. Um, phenylethylamine, okay, in, in the creation of neurotransmitters and excitatory side, it's, phenyl, it's um, phenylalanine, then tyrosine, to L-dopa, to dopamine, to norepinephrine, epinephrine, then metanephrine, and on down. Now, phenylethylamine, which comes from phenylalanine, okay, is one of the two neurotransmitters you need for focus. So when you have somebody with an attention deficit disorder, okay, not the way it's written today, but there's two main reasons. One, they don't have enough phenylethylamine and norepinephrine which are directly responsible for your ability to focus, easiest one to fix, right? Or two, their brain is moving, their mind is moving so fast that they have the attention span of a gnat. Same symptoms, two completely different root causes, okay? Uh, so I'm not sure what the MAOGG or WATS, what's my favorite thing to treat what? I don't. Uh, so if somebody could repeat that, that would be wonderful. Uh, we talked about the CBS thing. Um, thank you for saying that healing the gut, um, healing the gut kills pathogens, not killing 24 seven. You know, uh, the person who wrote that, and I apologize because all it says she is Facebook users. Um, the, uh, killing bugs is a, you gotta be careful. Okay. When somebody is chronically ill and, and remember, I mean that with autistic children, they have a ton of toxins that they have to detoxify. So uh, uh, probably a better order of treatment, on generally speaking, would be to work on the foundation of the body first, okay? In other words, decreasing inflammation, fixing the gut, that's going to allow the detoxification pathways to get rid of what they've got, and there's going to be less burden on them before you start killing bugs, right? Because once you start killing bugs, you have to deal with those toxins. So the joke I always say is that suppose you had a you know a thousand candida you know cells in front of you and you have a 30 caliber machine gun and you start raking them down. Your body has to deal with all those bodily fluids. If you set it up so that you balance neurotransmitters as well as fixing the gut and so forth, and this is why it's individualized, okay? The type of treatment. I can give you generalities, but it actually has to be individualized. And you will take the start taking the burden off the body. Then you can start going after whatever bugs need to be gone after, okay, in a stepwise fashion. You don't necessarily have to create a hearse, okay. You can build things up, build your antimicrobials, antiparasitics, antifungals up. And the way you do that, let's say we're using oil of oregano, we're using uh, artemisian emulsion, whatever it happens to be, okay. You start at the lower end of whatever the spectrum of treatment is, and you start working your way up. So I'm going to use just, um, let's say 20 drops a day of whatever, okay, is what's considered a therapeutic dose. You start at one drop a day, and then you start bringing it up to two, then you start bringing it up to three. Let's say you get to about 10 drops, and your child really starts getting sick, or their behavior really goes out of, out of control. Well, you know, they're handling more toxins at that point. So you stop what you're doing. Okay. Let him get back to baseline, him or her back to baseline a little bit. And then if you're going to restart, you restart at about five drops a day. Okay, You know now it's killing the bugs. But if you do it to the point, not till they get sick, but just before that, you're killing the bugs at a rate that their detox system can handle. And then at intervals, you start increasing the doses to see if they still have a reaction. What you'll find is that as you kill off more bugs, you're able to use more and more antimicrobial or anti whatever, okay? And they're not going to react. They don't. You don't have to hurt them. A lot of people like, oh, let's give you know, 
in their mind, I'm, I'm telling you a little secret. I don't, and I don't like this about some, some practitioners. They're saying in their head, if, if I give them a herx, I know they know that I'm doing something. You don't have to hurt the child or anybody else for that matter. Um, and there you go. My sons got healed after we stopped killing because you were dealing with so many, um, so many toxins. What do you think about the PK protocol for cell membrane rebuilding? I think the P PK protocol does work very well. Incredibly expensive. Okay, and there are other ways, other things you can do for most people. The PK protocol should be used as a last resort when nothing else is working. Okay, because there's so many other things to do. It's sort of like uh, fecal transplants. Okay, when they first came out, they were wonderful. You know why? Because people were properly selected. They did everything, and this is when nothing else worked. Then all of a sudden, they're doing it primarily, which means they're doing it first. That's why it's not working as well. For some people, it does. Some people, it doesn't. Okay. Um, you're using an optimal. Optimal PC is an excellent product, but it's not liposomal. Okay. For transdermal supplements. The transdermal supplements, I use PatchMD, patchmd.com. Okay. Uh, they've gone a little nutty with their, with their patches. They've got a million other patches. They've got an autism patch. Forget all that stuff, okay? That mm, The patches that work the best there, if you have a child, uh, when I say child, I mean somebody who's not, let's say, 100 pounds or less, okay? They have a kid's multivitamin, multimineral, omega-3 patch, one patch a day, perfect for especially a small child, okay? With that, if you have a suspicion about that a recycling pathway, you can use that CoQ10 patch, with a larger child or an adult, they have a multivitamin plus patch, which I use a lot, the omega-3 patch, and of course that CoQ10 patch. Now, if you wanted more NAD, they have what's called an NAD complete patch, which is the same thing that's in the CoQ10 patch, just more NAD, which believe it or not, is like getting a small IV of NAD per day. And let me tell you something, it fixes a lot of different problems, okay? Um, so that's the company name. Interested to know more about those patches. I just said that. Slow CMT and slow MAO. I don't know. That's a statement, not a question. So if you could ask a question, I'd appreciate it. Do you think quick kill silver PS uh, is better than absorbed than Zymogen? Um, the best I can say is um, the people who make the, uh, in order, okay, the people who make the best liposomes are Victor Nutrition International, they're called a protosome. That's that protovite is the strongest protosome on the market. How can you tell? Because it can hold minerals. You'll never see a multi-mineral liposomal product because most liposomes aren't strong enough to hold them. The next thing, the next people, the next best is Quicksilver Scientific. They make a very good product. Okay, um, Dr. Ben makes excellent products. It's not just because he's my friend, which I told you that at the beginning. It's because I know exactly what he goes through to make his products. Okay, I've been with him. I've listened to him. We've, you know, I've, I know exactly his products. If you have to make a choice in products and you don't know which ones to pick, you have to go by the reputation of the lab. And so, you know, if, if you pick like, let's say, Quicksilver Scientific, you know it's going to get in. Okay, you pick like Seeking Health, you know it's going to get in because it's good products and it has, you know, Kirkman is good. You know, it all depends on which product you're talking about. So I'm not. I think the Zymogen products are, are good products. I, I would tend to um, hang, uh, I would tend to hang with Quicksilver because, um, okay, what you mean is what's my favorite thing for fighting inflammation, especially for slow CMT, slow MAO? Uh, okay, great. Uh, in answer to the question, the slow, the slow MAO and CMT really don't come into play, okay? What you do is fix the gut, fix the cells, and then if you need to balance something else. But if you do those two things, in other words, support the cellular function and support the cell membrane, which is all how we're treating leaky gut and leaky cells, okay, what you're going to do is give the cells what it needs to work. So whether it's slow, fast, or otherwise, that's the way your physiology works. And as long as you don't try and push it with a single product, which is often what happens when people use methyl B12 or methylfolate, they're using large amounts, and a lot of people get reactions to them because they're trying to push a single area 
and that causes all kinds of peripheral problems, usually a lot of release of adrenaline and so forth. Okay, so believe it or not, being more general and being careful, you know, and I realize some people do very well with the methyl products, but a lot of people don't. So since I'm on that subject, how do, how do you know? You don't, right? I don't care who says what, I really don't, okay, because I've been doing this a long time, <clears throat> right? So here's how you can tell. If you want to know if your child or you need a methyl product, and you're going to start with methyl folate, let's say, you start with a quarter dose, a few days later, go up to a half dose, whatever the bottle says, and over a period of a week or two, build your way up to the full therapeutic dose. Now, you're going to get one of four reactions. First, you're going to see the behavior go wild, or you're going to feel terrible if you're taking it, in which case you should stop. Okay, I've had people call, call me up and say, I can only have a crumb of methyl B12. I'm like, why are you taking it? I need the methyl group. You're not. You're not getting enough there to do anything. All right. So second reaction. You start taking it. You start building it up. And you, you feel okay. In about two weeks, you start feeling pretty bad again or your child's behavior changes. What happened there is you're messing with other pathways. All right. So you should stop and reassess. Three, you build up. You feel better or your child gets better and better and better and better. You hit the nail on the head. All right. Fourth, you start giving the person the methyl folate, let's say. You build it up to the therapeutic dose. The person's not better. The person's not worse. All that says is that the body has accepted the vitamin. There's no problems with it. And it's not the answer to your problem. Okay. So it's not bad, but it's not what you were looking for. Guess what? That's the way you're going to know. There's no predictive power. Everybody's an individual. So if you're going to use methylated products, just start slow, build yourself up. And if there's a problem, back off. What happens if you don't, if you can't take 5-methylfolate? Well, a natural folate is a really good idea. They sell natural folate products, okay? Or folinic acid. Folinic, not folic, folinic acid is the precursor that you can get on the market, okay? B12 doesn't necessarily have to be methyl B12. Cyano B12, uh, cyanocobalamin, is very poorly absorbed in the gut. You ever notice with the cheap vitamins, they have cy cyanocobalamin, it's 1,667% of the RDA. You know why? Because they're putting that in. They're not being nice to you, but they're hoping that some gets across by diffusion. All right. So if you can't take a methyl group, you can take hydroxycobalamin, adenosylcobalamin, because when it hits the gut, it will deconjugate. You get the cobalamin and then the carrier group. And then the cobalamin will go to MTR, cobalamin 1, cobalamin 2, MTR, and make your own methylcobalamin. That's the way it works. All righty. Um, uh, my opinion on breast milk for gut healing. Thank you very much for bringing that up. Breast milk for gut healing is wonderful, really expensive. You know what works really well? Camel's milk. Okay. Uh, I could do an entire lecture on camel's milk. Camel's milk is available. It's organic. Um, my suggestion, if you're going to use camel milk, it's micronized. It's made for baby camels, okay? So it really heals well. Got it honestly does. Um, let me tell you how to use, what to look for and how to use it, okay? Uh, the camel's milk in the United States, uh, there's, there's a few places. Uh, all you do is type in camel's milk in Google. You'll see the camel milk co-op and a couple of others, that Desert Farms. They're all good. They treat the animals very well. Uh, you want to start with the pasteurized, not the raw. Because if you have a leaky gut and you put raw camel's milk in, you're kind of exposing somebody to whatever microorganisms they have Okay, in the milk. Uh, you can get it frozen. You can get it powdered, a lot of stuff. Start at a tablespoon a day and work your way up to about a half cup a day. That's the therapeutic dose, half cup a day. Okay, and you'll see changes. Besides, the kids really like it. I like it. It's pretty good. The only problem with camel's milk is it's expensive. Okay, it is. So that's why I've been hanging on the gut butter because um, I, I actually sell to my patients a gut butter trial kit, you know, so they can try it. So, because if you bought, bought everything, it, it can get pricey. But when you buy everything, it's good for like nine or ten. It's good for four and a half months of batches that you'd make. 
but if somebody wants to try it and they're my patient already, then I, I'll, I'll sell them, you know, a little kit so they can make two or three weeks worth. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, to the question from, I can't pronounce the name. Want to know how to handle infections pathogens when CDR is stopped with ceramin. Thank you for asking that question. That is such a cool question. Okay. Um, the, uh, the studies that were done with autistic children and ceramin, which is an antiparasitic drug, an old one, uh, Dr. Navio was able to reverse autism for like six to eight weeks. I mean, you know, but it came back. And of course, there's no studies right now, but the reason for it is because there are root causes that are causing autism and they're building up again. It's because whatever created the cell danger response chronically, if you will, is still there. So if you know the pathogens involved, which is going to be kind of important, all right, when the CDR is stopped with ceramin, that is a wonderful time to go after them rather aggressively. Uh, you have to do this under medical, under professional supervision because there's too many variables. But if I could stop the CDR in somebody, like, bing, you know, which means that within days, their detox systems, everything's going to just work and better. It's, everything's going to drain. Everything's going to be better. Yes, you want to fix the, uh, the gut as best you can. Personally, the way I would handle something like this, since the ceramin stops it for six to eight weeks, I would do the first round. I would aggressively fix the gut, the cells, and everything. I just pour everything in. Why? Because the inflammation is not there. The body's not fighting the cell danger response. And guess what? You're going to start fixing things real good. You might find as a result of that that you might not even need more ceramin because you've corrected the physiology and now the, the immune system's going after what it's supposed to go after. But let's say it doesn't. And, you know, you, you get another shot of ceramin. Well, once you've spent six to eight or 10 weeks fixing the gut and fixing the cells, that's when you can go after. If you know what the pathogens are, go after them aggressively. Because remember, once you fix a gut, if you have to take antibiotics, antibiotics are not evil. The injudicious use of antibiotics is evil, okay? You can fix what the antibiotics do. I, You know you know what it does, so we fix it concomitantly when you're taking the antibiotic. Don't worry about that. That's easy, all right? But guess what? You have to know, okay? And this is where interpreting the tests and so forth can get a little bit um, complex. But that's the way I would handle something like that. Any particular plan of digestive enzymes for a kid? Um, uh, you know, I usually uh, look around for chewables. It, it all depends on what the kid can do and what the kids, you know, what their tastes are like and so forth. Sometimes they use bitters. Sometimes they use just chewable enzymes. Some kids can swallow capsules. It's very variable. And in a, a particular brand, I don't have a particular brand that I use. Um, I try and I just try and find stuff that has what I'm looking for in it, and um, then I look at what's, you know, what the ingredients are, and then you know that's when I think about the lab. If I see a lab that I trust, then that's what I pick. Uh, was regarding hospital uh, PS, your thoughts about liposomal products that are best absorbed by the body? Uh, I believe I already answered that. If you have to pick liposomal products, Victory Nutrition International. Uh, Quicksilver Scientific and uh, Seeking Health Products. Um, been on uh, camel's milk for two years, but didn't help. Uh, breast milk is life changing. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And remember, not everything works for everybody. Okay, that's a reality. Not everything works for everybody. If you have tools in your toolbox, okay, you can start pulling them out when you need them. Okay, if you've ever had a house. And you, you know, you got a special tool for a special job. And 20 years later, that something came up again, you could reach into the toolbox and say, ah, I have what I need. So breast milk is excellent, tough to get. And if I, as I understand, it's on the real pricey side. I mean, there are, you know, fructal oligosaccharides, which are the, you know, the, um, the most nerves. Well, there are human oligosaccharides, okay, which are much better and hellishly expensive and difficult to get sometimes, depending on where you are. Okay, so yes, if you have tools in your toolbox, there's probably a load of reasons why the camel's milk didn't work, but the breast milk did, 
Okay. And I'm happy for you that it did and that you did what you did. But here's one suggestion for everybody. If you're on something for a period of time, let's say three months, and you're not getting anywhere, reset. Now, I'm not going to tell you to stop. I'm going to tell you to reassess what's going on. So if you're on camel's milk for a long time and you're at a therapeutic dose like a half cup, and you're getting two, three months, and you're not seeing any changes, that's when you start thinking about changing. Okay? And your experience in mentioning it here is going to help a lot of people. I, I apologize. I don't know that you're but thank you for, for mentioning that. Okay? I don't see any other questions, and it's been like a, an hour and a half. And as you can tell... I like to yammer, <laughs> okay? Um, I'm very honored to be here. I, I, I you know, take uh, treating the autistic community as a um, as a sacred trust, really. I really do work my best. Uh, anybody who'd like to consider working with me, they can go to my website, drjessarmine.com. Uh, when you see Become a Patient, there'll be a button you can press for a complimentary 30-minute uh, consultation, okay? Uh, so that you can talk with me and we can we can hash things out. And the purpose of that is to see if I can help you or not. Uh, do you think these kids need to be on these supplements for life once we repair and stop uh, the supplements or would they regress? Well, the answer to your first part is no. And the only way to find out once you've done your due diligence is to start withdrawing and see if they regress. Now, depending on the situation, and again, you know, if you just did one thing and they're regressing, sometimes the indicator is there are stones left unturned, okay? But if you've done everything, okay, and you pull back one thing at a time, okay, when there's a little bit of regression and you reestablish, you know, you restart everything you've done or whatever you stopped, um, you have to assess the reason for that. But they don't have to be on for life, okay? Okay, we gave a B12 methyl shot, but it didn't see anything go to bed. Exactly what I said. Fourth scenario, okay? The body accepted the B12, but it's not the answer to your question. Can you please answer my question? What is your favorite diet to heal the gut? Um, that is uh, wholly dependent on the individual, okay? Um, I, don't use pro I don't use a protocol-based uh, approach, uh, but the general things, of course, is to you know take away the big three, you know, uh, uh, gluten, casein, and soy. Uh, really, I'd have to talk to the individual to make a particular recommendation, but I'm the kind of person that likes to do this very individually. So I don't say just go on the GAPS diet, go on the, uh, you know, autoimmune paleo diet and so forth. I, I'm very, very particular. Autistic children are, are, there's so many reasons for what they have. There's so many considerations and believe me, Dietary changes are some of the greater stressors in life, okay? So I work with people as best I can. So I apologize I can't give you a, a, a you know, a try to answer for that because uh, it's not the way that I practice, okay? Um, I hope I answered everybody's questions. I really appreciate you letting me be here. Um, you have my contact information if you have questions. You. You can email me, whatever. I could be happy to try and answer things. And again, thank you for your attention. I really do appreciate it. And I hope everybody has a great Christmas. Okay? And I'm going to hit a bunch of buttons here. I don't know how to stop this thing. Um, it's the first time I'm using it. I'm sorry. Stop stream? Yes. Everybody have a good day. Take care.